it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Brendan Dunlop. Many of you will have had a copy of his book. Hopefully some of you had his copy even before the conference, because I think it's an incredibly useful um, book that not only therapists can use with their clients, but it's also helpful for, um, to use for clients, just well, for members of the community, shall we say, because they're not clients. People, our queer brothers and sisters and other siblings, to, um, to take some of their mental health care into their own hands um, and do some empowerment work there. So uh, thank you for writing it. It's a brilliant book. Floor's yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Lovely to be here and to see everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Dominic. I've got quite a lot to pack into 45 fairly short minutes. So some stuff that I'm going to present on the slides, I'm going to kind of necessarily gloss over some of it, just because I think the experience and wealth of knowledge in the room is really immense. And I think some of the stuff that I might touch upon is probably quite familiar territory. Um, I just don't know why that shows that uh, display there. Okay, there we go, that looks a bit better. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is necessarily at times going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, so I might talk a little bit about self injury and self harm um, just very, very briefly because uh, we know that those things disproportionately affect the queer communities. Um, and of course, you know, a variety of different traumas as well. So I always trust people when I do these types of talks just to always look after themselves and you know yourself better than anyone else. So do what you need to do. So I know at the start was a little bit of a Mentimeter as well. This might just be something just to kind of do in your own head because, again, I'm very aware of the audience. Um, but maybe just think about what your current level of knowledge and competence and confidence is working with uh, queer clients. And then let's have a look at that towards the end. This presentation, I think, follows on really, really nicely from what Dominic was saying because what I'm going to talk about is a lot of the stuff that a lot of us in the room probably already do, but just through a, a very slightly different lens, and it's, it's a bit more of a zoomed out lens, really thinking about the systems and the structures that exist around us and our clients, which I completely share Dominic's position as therapists, I believe that we can never be neutral. I believe that working with the populations that we work with is inherently political. Uh, and that's what I kind of talk about in this, in this type of talk. So the roadmap for what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to very quickly touch upon the book. And then I'm going to move into these uh, kind of systems of oppression, I guess, that operate around us and that become, can become internalized within us. I'm going to touch upon minority stress and cognitive behavioural therapy. Again, people will, might be very familiar with these things already, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about them. I'm going to focus a little bit on the importance of intersectionality, because again, I think that's a really, really important facet of the work that we do, and we can't divorce the fact that we all inhabit multiple, sometimes minoritised identities. And what, does that, what happens when those things come together? And then if we've got time, which is probably a big if, I'll share a couple of the exercises from the book that I really enjoy using with clients and that I enjoy writing, <laughs> um, just to kind of give you a little bit of an insight into some of those slices of my uh, thinking. So very quickly, the book, which uh, some of you might have uh, seen before, some of you might just be picking it up today. I'm really, really grateful and humbled that the book was kind of provided today. So I really hope that people find use in it. Um, the first part is a kind of quite generic part and it has chapters which are applicable to lots of uh, queer people, their families, friends, and us as therapists as well. So the basics I think of queer mental health, identity, self-acceptance, um, relationships and intersectionality are all focused upon in that first part. And then the second part moves much more into the specific challenges that we know disproportionately affect uh, the queer communities. So you've got things in there like shame, trauma, self-harm, suicide, um, difficulties with eating, feeling low, feeling anxious. 
the things that I'm sure lots of people have been talking with their clients about for probably very, very many years. So why did the book come into existence? Um, I was talking with uh, Silver and uh, Serge over here earlier just about the, I guess, the massive sense of imposter syndrome that comes with writing anything, really, and people might be familiar with that kind of critical friend. Um, but I was working with quite a few queer clients in a lot of the kind of clinical placements that I was doing throughout my training. Um, and then I worked specifically for a chunk of time in a HIV service as well, where I was kind of seeing quite a few queer clients. Um, and I, I was finding that there wasn't really many um, kind of comprehensive type resources that I could direct them to and say, go and work through those activities. You know, think about these things from that kind of more zoomed out perspective. Um, and I also couldn't see some of the therapies that I was being trained in, like CBT, um, uh, CFT, um, other kind of third wave therapies, which is mostly what I was kind of trained in, um, centralizing the kind of minoritized experience. Um, so I was thinking it would be really, really useful, I think, to try and provide some exercises that really bring that lens to this specific experience. And I wanted something that, as Dominic says, is a bit different to therapy, because we know that therapy will work for some people. We also don't talk enough about the fact that therapy doesn't work for about a third of people. Well, about a third of people remain the same when they come to see us, and about a third of people can sometimes get worse. So I was very mindful of the fact that if someone's got a resource that they can work through in the comfort of their own home, they can order it online, it can come in discreet packaging, even if they're not embracing that part of themselves yet, maybe that'll be useful. So that's what I kind of wanted to do. So in the book, I centralise kind of three specific ideas. And I call these the kind of circles of influence around people. And if anyone in the room is familiar with kind of uh, Bron from Brenner and the kind of ecological systems theory, you will recognise these circles of influence as being very, very similar to that, just kind of with a bit more of a, I guess, queer lens. So I talk about people and groups being really, really important to our clients, the people we work with. The institutions, the policies, the laws that exist within the territory or country in which we are living or our clients are living. And then finally, the social stories and the social narratives that are told to us, but also kind of baked into our kind of social psyche and that we just kind of come to believe as being true without necessarily really challenging maybe where that's come from. Oh, some jazzy visuals there for you. You get that for free. So these are the circles of influence in the book. So I encourage clients to think about this quite a lot when they're kind of reflecting upon some of their own challenges and experiences. So that's probably pretty small. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure quite a few of you will not be able to see that. But basically, uh, the example that I give on the right, which you'll see in the book, is just the idea that, you know, we might see a person in our um, therapy room on our Zoom uh, call that might be thinking about, you know, why am I so different? And I think zooming out around this and just thinking about those systems, actually, you know, the parents might be, um, as Alex says, yeah, I wish my daughter was normal. Uh, this, this LGBT stuff wasn't around when I was growing up. These might be some of the things that this, let's think of it as a young person, might be hearing in their home. But then thinking about the, that broader circle of influence, that kind of more kind of social narrative, law policy type stuff, well, gay marriage might have been illegal in that person's home country for many, many years. It might still be. Um, there might not be diverse representation of different family structures on television. There might be um, you know, people that don't challenge transphobia within workplaces or within schools. So that stuff gets into the minds of people, doesn't it? It trickles down and it gets into the heads of, of, of lots of different people. And of course, if you are a young person interacting with your caregivers, that's the stuff which you begin to internalize as well. So I talk a lot about 
this kind of trickle down effect and helping people to just basically take the sting out of the tail, I think. This idea that there's nothing wrong with you. This is a huge system that is very broken and very abusive. So I'm not going to show this clip because it's going to probably just create too many technical uh, nightmares. But um, section 28 is something which I'm sure lots of people in the room are very acutely aware of. I sometimes show this when I'm, when I'm um, doing this type of presentation to students or to people which are maybe not so familiar with kind of queer history. So um, this is just an example of the fact that wide policy, law and practice has a very real influence on individual well-being. Which is why I always talk with people about the fact that, yes, as therapists, we are supposed to be helping people that have individualised distress, but we must also be using our voices and our implicit and explicit power to sometimes levy against some of these policies and practices where we can. And helping our clients to do that if needs be. Things like writing letters to schools is something that I've done before for people when a young person is telling me that they are neurodivergent and queer and actually the room's really, really noisy and people are really mean to them in the classroom and teachers are not doing anything about that. So I say to their parents, you know, you have a chat with the school and if you're not getting anywhere, I'm also very happy to write a letter because sometimes, unfortunately, they need a bit of oomph from someone which they perceive to be in a powerful, powerful position. So I am more than happy to levy that type of stuff when I feel like it is in that person's best interests. Which again, is probably not, not what we're always taught to do as therapists, that we should not get involved in that type of stuff. Whereas I think I can do as much individual work with that young person as I want but to send them back into a harmful and abusive and oppressive environment is just, it's going to be crap, isn't it? So I'm going to gloss over this because we, this is going to be familiar stuff. So growing up queer and living as queer can be challenging. There is a whole plethora of difficulties that come alongside this. And I, I know what Dominic says because sometimes when I've given this talk before, People say to me afterwards, uh, oh, thanks for talking about that, but um, you focused a lot on the negative stuff. And I say, yeah, do you know what? I do focus quite a lot on the negative stuff. And that's because I think it's, it's really important to not always dress things up in sunshine and rainbows and say, oh, yeah, but, you know, you've got marriage now and you've got pride and you've got all these different things. I still think the individualised experience of the people that I talk to is pretty traumatic for a lot of people. And yes, resilience is a buzzword that gets thrown around quite a lot and people loved the word resilience, didn't they, in, in COVID. But I think for people to be resilient, you still need resource. You still need some stuff to draw upon to build that resilient shield. And I think queer people often don't have those resources available to them to help them build up their resilience as a lot of other people perhaps can. So, I am not neglecting the fact that there are lots of fabulous things about being queer and there are lots of protective and resilient factors which I'll touch upon very slightly in the minority stress model, though I do want to just talk about some of the trickier stuff just because I feel like that's also important. So, there's lots of challenges. Um, we've got legacies of things such as the H HIV and AIDS um, uh, crisis and epidemic. Things, people are really surprised. When I give this talk to sometimes um, audiences that are maybe not so knowledgeable on kind of queer specific issues, they're really, really um, quite surprised to hear that. I think for the first time, either this year or last, the, the, the kind of identifying category of people that were newly diagnosed with HIV was actually uh, heterosexual folk. And that's for the, for the first time ever, the number of new diagnoses has exceeded that of the kind of queer populations. And a lot of people don't know that because, well, I asked them, why is that shocking? And they say, oh, because I thought that was just something that was contained to certain groups. 
And I think, wow, things like that legacy of HIV and AIDS and the narratives that are still associated with that are still permeating the minds and thoughts of people right now and right here which is why I talk so much about stories with people and about the importance of recognising where some things come from and just really having a lens to think about that. So, apologies, you're probably not going to be able to see that as well because there's a huge big bunch of light just hitting this screen here. But in the book, I talk about kind of systems of oppression. And again, these things are probably not going to be too, too unfamiliar to people. Things like the patriarchy, socioeconomic division, um, ableism, um, political oppression, gendered violence, things like this are systems of oppression that operate around us. And of course, they will operate within the context of us seeing our clients. And what I am really interested in is actually when those systems of oppression are maybe enacted within the therapy room as well. So those of you that are maybe more psychodynamically or psychoanalytically leaning, you know, those ideas of transference and counter-transference, I really, I'm always interested to see, I guess, how oppression is enacted in the therapy room as well, whether we're consciously aware of it or not. Because I think I've certainly come across some people before where I think oppression is something which I think you are aware of in the room, and I think it's something which maybe you need to think about in your own supervision because that seems to be something that's a little bit conscious. And of course, you know, clients will push people's buttons in lots of different ways, but that's for us to deal with in our supervision, not to be enacted in the therapy room as much as is possible. And there's, there's a, a square on here that I get asked about because people sometimes haven't heard of this word before. And I only came across it very recently when I was doing research into bisexuality and self-injury. And that's epistemic injustice. Don't know if people have heard of this word before, but this is uh, uh, coined by someone called Miranda Fricker. And Miranda talks about the idea that basically if people are wronged or silenced in their position as a knowledge giver, that is epistemic injustice. So an example, just to contextualise that, I was interviewing lots of bisexual people that had engaged in self-injury and self-harmful behaviours and asking them about their experiences of, of, of navigating the world, really, and how that interacted with their self-harm. And a lot of people were saying the things that kind of come out are people telling them, oh, you're not really bi, you know, you, you, you're kind of going through a phase, you know, or um, you're on this road to coming out as gay, you'll, you'll get there one day. That kind of real biphobic kind of narrative that permeates a lot of media representation or misrepresentation as well, that's a form of epistemic injustice because you are silencing someone that knows the truth. They know their own truth. So that's what epistemic injustice is. And you might have seen something like this before. I really, really like this type of infographic. This idea that there are certain identifiers that are more or less powerful and privileged based on the societies in which we live and what is, fa what is favoured in certain societies. And the um, author of this wheel very kindly gave me permission to adapt it slightly for inclusion in the book. So you'll see a wheel very much like that in the book itself as well. Um, and thinking about oppression and systems of oppression. I also really like this because this idea of kind of balloons and just kind of helping people to visualize this idea of privilege, really, and how these systems of oppression can escape some people. So if you are, if you are white, um, middle class, um, have got a good family support network, you know, you have got, um, yeah, money in the bank, you're heterosexual, cisgendered, you've got a lot of balloons, you know, that you're holding and you can physically and metaphorically take off, can't you? But then the more kind of minoritized identities that you inhabit and the more systems of oppression that operate in and around you, the less balloons you get. So this kind of uphill struggle, I think, is a, is, is a good visual metaphor for what life can be like for some people. So, 
Minority stress theory, again, this might be something that is very familiar to people. If not, this is um, a real kind of pivotal theory, I guess, in the, the kind of queer mental health space. So the basic premise, as I have up there, is that being a sexual minority, because this was originally created for sexuality, it's been adapted for gender um, and gender identity uh, more recently. But being a sexual minority was an inherently stressful experience because there were stresses in the world that were close to us, proximal, and a bit further away, so a little bit more distant, which may have caused distal stresses. So an example of a distal stressor is kind of maybe interpersonal difficulties or prejudice from other people. But then a proximal stressor, something that's a bit closer to us, might be the, the stress associated with having to conceal your identity or that internalised sense of homo bio transphobia that people might have. So that's the kind of schematic. Again, I'm going to brush over this. I'll, I'll see if we can maybe get the slides sent out to people so you can read up about this a bit more if you're interested. Um, but yeah, you can see here that um, there is a, a, a nod to kind of community and resilience and protective factors in this model. And there's the kind of schematic for, um, I guess, a focus more on gender, uh, adapted from the, the kind of gender stress framework. So CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, this might be something that people are familiar with in the room. Um, I'm sure you have probably at least all heard of it, whether you practice it or not is another thing. Um, basic premise, thoughts, feelings, behaviour and physical sensations, I guess, all interact. They influence each other and are influenced by each other as well. So there's the kind of hot cross bun schematic by Podesky and Mooney that kind of really helps to visualise this. So here's an example. I don't want to go to school. You know, that might be a thought someone's having. They might feel a bit of that tight chest, some of that kind of fight or flight type symptoms that we are uh, familiar with. They might feel scared. And then they might do something about that, because why wouldn't we as humans do something about our distress? They might avoid school, they might stay at home and play video games, because that makes them feel a little bit better. So, if I was working with someone, and I talk about this, of course, in the book, I think it's really important to consider those circles around them, rather than focusing just on that hot cross bun that um, we might be tempted to focus on in CBT. I think CBT, when done well, can be really great for minoritised people. But my worry about CBT, and the reason why I don't always love CBT, is because I think if CBT is delivered poorly, or it is um, delivered quickly, because we've mentioned IAPT, we've mentioned Target, we've mentioned crisis, lots of people having to come through our doors, the invalidation of very valid thoughts is our risk. That's the huge risk. And I know that um, folks that have written about this in kind of more academic leaning journals have said the way we need to be countering this, this is a very slight side, is um, not by necessarily challenging the validity of the thought, but thinking about the helpfulness of the thought which I think that is just really stuck with me and that's what I try and embody with people. Okay, your thought about um, being bullied or whatever and worrying about being bullied is valid. We're not gonna do any bloody CBT strategies for pros and cons lists or thought challenging that. What we can do though is say, how helpful is it for you to wake up each morning and feel this level of worry? You know, does it pull you closer to your values as a person or does it kind of lead you, lead you astray from them? You know, how helpful is it to kind of be occupying this space all the time, which sounds really, really difficult. And actually, if it's not helpful, we can do something about that. Maybe we can try and interact with this thought in a slightly lighter way. But that doesn't mean the thought is wrong. And that's the, that's the crucial thing, I think. So, for example, if we think about the circles of influence around that example that I've just given, this, this person might be going to a school that has no gender neutral bathrooms. The curriculum is not at all inclusive of diversity and teachers are not challenging transphobia in the classroom. So suddenly, zooming out, we think, 
that person not wanting to go to school kind of makes a lot of sense. And I would be thinking, looking at that, going, right, whilst I am doing this work with this young person, there's work to do with that system. Because, as I mentioned before, we can't help someone and push them back into an abusive and actively harmful system. So that's why I, I, I try and get people to think about that in the book, is that, look, zoom out, think about your environment and context. And I'm not saying that you can necessarily go in and change everything. But what I hope you can do by doing that is to just see it's not all in your head. It's not all you that's wrong, if anything. And maybe that just takes this thing out of the tail to begin with. So again, I talk about this in the book, existence for people that are minoritized full stop, never mind queer, you think about uh, race, ethnicity, neurodivergence, you know, being uh, disabled in some way. It's overwhelming and traumatic to always confront these systems of oppression that are, are, are doing nothing for us. They are keeping people that have privileged positions in privileged positions. And that experience of minority stress is exhausting and it leaves people without the resource and the energy to really fight and dismantle those much broader systems. So what happens? The systems remain. And sometimes, and I know that this happened, um, I think in 2008 when uh, Michael King released the paper that looked at prevalence rates of kind of low mood anxiety, self-harm, suicidality in, um, I think it was LGB populations. When that was found to be really elevated, some people turned around and said, aha, told you, told you there was something wrong with those people. Look, evidence. Without fully appreciating, there's a very good reason why those rates are very elevated. So, of course, people then see the results, these mental health challenges, as somehow evidence for deficit. And that's a really tricky position to then be in, because how do you fight when you're exhausted and those structures and systems are doing nothing to help you? So here's just another little schematics. Those of you that might be familiar with cog um, Compassion Focused Therapy, CFT, might recognise elements of this towards the end, towards the right-hand side. These systems of oppression around us, the external environment in which people live, can lead to thoughts, feelings and behaviours. So, thoughts, what's wrong with me? Why does no one like me? Feelings of rejection, um, sadness, anger. Very, very valid anger. People do things to survive, I find. People don't do things because they fancy it today. People do things because they need to remain centered, calm, and alive. So, what will make me feel better? Who can I blame? What can I do? So, it's been mentioned already. Substances, hugely elevated within queer communities. What does that do? Maybe it's about connection, or feeling part of something. Maybe it's about just dealing with all of that inside. But of course, sometimes these have unintended consequences. We don't wake up purposefully trying to put ourselves on the back foot. But those feelings of um, emotional dysregulation, turbulent relationships with other people, sometimes internalised, sometimes externalised homobiotransphobia, there's a huge slice, isn't there, of the queer worlds that are really um, actively harmful, you know? And it's that kind of idea of when you are so oppressed, some people's survival mechanism is to oppress others. And I guess we see that, don't we, in the spheres in which we work and move in. So queer mental health is multi-layered, it's contextual. This is the message that I try and, I guess, push out into the world and I try and talk about in the book. These things trickle down, they come from somewhere. People are not born feeling like they're different. They are othered and they are made different by people. So there's historic and intergenerational trauma. What happened to our parents, our grandparents, great grandparents? What was the context in which they were living? What stories did they pass on to their children that we then hear? 
when we're sitting around the dinner table or sitting in uh, amongst friends, hearing from what their families have been talking about. That internalised sense of phobia, that um, felt sense of violence and threat, if not actual violence, of course will lead to feeling anxious. Of course this will feel, people will feel like they've got these big feelings that they don't know what to do with. Of course we're going to see people hurting themselves and restricting what they're eating because people have been ha having certain assumptions and ideas about what you should or shouldn't look like if you are X. So this, again, I'm going to gloss over this quickly. This is just an example of using the minority stress model. So religion, telling you that being gay is wrong, difficult relationships with family, they're distal stresses, they're a bit further away. Proximal stresses, that internalised sense of homophobia, this vigilance from others, you know, this kind of constant looking out for threat, that overactivity of the fight or flight system that I'm sure your clients talk about or present with quite frequently, I would guess, in the therapy room. Consequences of that, feeling anxious, everyone must be looking at me, gosh, you know, everyone's always staring. Uh, relationship difficulties, if, if, if I'm the one that is um, mean to other people, at least I'm in control of what's going on. Might not be a conscious thought, but it might be the underlying function. And of course, those protective resilience factors are important. Connection and community, even if that's online, could be really, really important to buffer some of these things. Uh, and a small, close group of friends, again, can do the world of wonder for some people. But it's a small buffer. There's bigger things, there's bigger fish to fry in this kind of formulation. So here you go, here's the CBT model in context. So again, yeah, thinking about, uh, uh, I can't cope, feeling rejected, ang angry, sad, heart beating fast, again, some of these familiar anxiety type symptoms. This person might be doing something to make those feelings feel easier. They might burn themselves. But let's zoom out, because I think it's always important for us to zoom out. They might be being bullied. They might have a mum that's not accepting of their identity. This person might have read somewhere, magazine, books, online, that being a lesbian is wrong. This becomes internalised. And people might say online, again on social media, that, oh, hurting yourself kind of works. So this person might have started to try this behaviour because that's what they've read. Perhaps. It's an example. So, intersectionality, how are we doing for time? Not bad. So, intersectionality, some people in the room might be very familiar with intersectionality theory. Um, if not, then hopefully this is going to be a quick whistle-stop tour and provide a little bit of a dige digestible format for what this idea is. So Kimberly Crenshaw, um, a black American woman, professor of law, um, worked as a lawyer as well, and I think uh, uh, Kimberly's work as a lawyer, I think, informed a lot of her thinking about this topic because she noticed that black women had to confront and manage multiple minoritized identities. There was something about being black and there's something about being a woman that both unique cause, uniquely cause challenges. But when these things are married, there was a unique stress that I think Kimberly wasn't maybe seeing, um, or was seeing, but wasn't seeing a, a, an answer to it or kind of thinking about. So intersectionality are kind of, you know, the, the, this comes from the, the kind of North American term for an intersection in the road. We would probably call it a crossroads, wouldn't we? Or a junction, something like that. But where things cross over. So um, Audrey Lord, I mean, my colleague James Lee, who I think is maybe watching on Zoom, um, I know that this is a, a real favourite quote of James is that I've now adopted and internalised as well. I think it's, it's really beautiful from Audre Lorde, that idea that there's no such thing as single issue struggle because of course we don't live single issue lives and I think that's a really really nice um, connector to this idea of intersectionality. So just very briefly thinking back to those systems of oppression that we spoke about a little bit earlier, I want to introduce Marcus and these people are introduced in the book to you in the intersectionality chapter. Uh, and James, my colleague, did um, 
co-author this chapter with me as well. So this is the result of our joint thinking on this topic. So Marcus is standing at the side of this intersection. And Marcus is a heterosexual, able-bodied man, cisgender and white. So Marcus's experience of the world, we can probably hypothesize, is not too turbulent. Marcus might have some stuff going on in his personal life, but actually his navigation of the world is pretty stress-free, relatively stress-free. But I want to introduce to you Delizery. So this is a, uh, another person that has come to the intersection. But delizarine has got to navigate a couple of challenges now. There's a couple of cars that are driving towards her. And unlike Marcus, she's standing in the middle of the intersection and she has to manage the dodging of these two cars. And you can't see it on this um, at the moment here, but these cars represent gender and race. They're the two cars that she's having to dodge. Now, dodging cars is not something that I do very often, but I can imagine that that brings with it an incredible level of vigilance and stress and anxiety, having to make sure that you don't get run over or hit. So, Delizarine is a heterosexual cisgender woman and Delizarine is black. So Delizarine has got a couple of systems of oppression that operate around her, represented by these cards. The final person that we'd like to introduce you to is Hawk. So Hawk is a non-binary, deaf, pansexual Indian person. So their experience of the world is very different to both Marx and Delizarine's. And Hawk now has four cards to dodge, manage and deal with in this intersection of life. Sexuality, gender, disability and race. So a couple of the similar challenges and oppressive systems that Dinazreen was dealing with, but also a couple more. So we could probably hypothesise that Hawk is feeling a similar level, at least, of the anxiety and worry and threat that Dinazreen faced and probably an additive bit more as well. So this is just a bit of a visual representation just to try and kind of help illustrate to, uh, I guess, a, a lay audience in the book what intersectionality theory is about. And the idea in the book is that people can then explore their own aspects of intersectionality, their own parts of themselves that they celebrate, and the parts of themselves which maybe they have to manage a lot of, a lot of crap around, that they've not always thought very much about. So, in the last kind of five-ish minutes, I'll just very, very briefly touch upon a couple of the exercises from the book that I really enjoy. I enjoyed writing them and I enjoy using them. So the first one, again, you're not going to be able to see these, but I have put on there the page numbers. So the first one is the, um, it's an exercise from the identity chapter about the public and private self. And it's just an exercise to help people understand what parts of themselves show, show up in the morning. What parts of themselves do they embrace and do they share with the world? And what parts of themselves do they not? Maybe that's a personal choice. They don't want to share those parts of themselves. And that's totally fine. But also in this exercise, I ask people to think a little bit about, you know, maybe why they don't show up or that those parts don't show up in their life and if that's because of some system of oppression or some something in the circle of influences around them perhaps they can think a little bit about that and of course as we all know as <laughs> therapists the minute you tell someone to do something is the minute that they recoil and do the opposite so the the aim of this and in our personal lives as well the aim of this exercise is certainly not to direct people towards embracing or disclosing or showing parts of themselves that they don't feel ready to show but it's helping them reflect on it and think is am i hiding this part or keeping this part away because i feel like other people are making me do that and if the, if, if the answer to that question is yes then i can i it, on here i say how could you reframe this how could you think about embracing this in a slightly different way 
Um, I've got two more exercises, just this one and one other. So from the eating difficulties chapter, I, I really like kind of narrative therapy. I don't know if folks in the room are familiar with narrative therapy, um, but I love that because it's a real, well, it's a focus on stories, but also it, it can really help distance the person from the problem or the difficulty. So externalizing is a skill um, that is used a lot and talked about a lot in narrative therapy. Um, and I really like this idea of externalizing that maybe eating difficulty or eating disordered voice that people can sometimes talk to us about. So in this exercise, I help people to just think about picturing who Eddie or whoever, whoever they want to name this, uh, this, this person or thing is. What do they look like? What do they sound like? You know, what types of things do they say? And then just help them to think about them as people. What do you like doing? What do you like uh, thinking and feeling and saying and doing? What are your values? Just to try and help people to try and create a little bit of distance between this kind of eating difficulty that they might be experiencing and themselves as a very valid person. Because as we probably all have experienced or can perhaps empathise with, what can sometimes happen, especially in family units or groups of people, people can become the problem, you know, uh, you know, Amanda, the self-harmer, you know, or, you know, Kevin, the, the person that's uh, got anorexia. So I really like that, that um, exercise. And the final one that I will very quickly touch upon is, are these kind of suicide prevention wheels. Suicide is something that I think fills our clients and us as practitioners with anxiety, understandably so. And I think I was thinking about the fact that people need a way to talk about this and to connect with this part of their thinking that feels non-shaming, non-judgmental, non-directional as well. So in this chapter, I talk about all exercises as being completely optional. They're for you to self-reflect. So what we know from the suicide theory about connection, belongingness, um, all those kind of um, kind of key psychological constructs are translated into these wheels and people are encouraged to just shade in parts of the segments um, based on particular thoughts and feelings and behaviours and then I say to people this is not a professional risk assessment that's up to us we are the risk assessors but it is for you to look at that and go if I've shaded in that quite a lot maybe I need to think about that a little bit more I might need to get some support with that so you might want to just self-reflect on what I've spoken about. This might be familiar territory. This might be a recap on things you already know. There might be some little nuggets that are, are new. So it might just be helpful for you to think about whether you feel any different about your knowledge, competence and confidence working with this group in this very, very short 45 minute talk. So I've included some references. Some of these references are um, kind of like statistics and things like that that I've left in um, but yeah the bunch of what I've talked about uh, is definitely in there so that's me um, so thank you very much for having me <laughs>